places. Dr. Fung. Thanks very much. Morning, everyone. Uh, let me just uh, make sure that it's all set up. Is this out? Yeah, but do you try out real quick? Uh, it doesn't seem to be. Okay, I'll just use the other one. Uh, can I just quickly have a sh quick show of hands? How many of you actually see children? Okay, and how many of you see children for cataract and corneal co uh, cases or glaucoma? Okay, thanks very much. So uh, I will take a, uh, a quick whirlwind ride about the cases that I see, uh, maybe not the ones that you see all the time, but uh, at least I hope you enjoy the, uh, the videos and the cases there and all some of the studies that we'll discuss uh, later on as well. So first of all, uh, the sort of bread and butter for the pediatric anterior segments, pediatric cataracts. What a new stuff uh, in 2019. Well, before talking about the very new stuff, we just want to talk about, first of all, the basic understanding that we now have over the last, I would say, 40, 50 years. Some of these work actually was uh, lifted from a book uh, written by Dr. Eisenberg, who just retired from UCLA. Uh, we know that babies are small. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, I think the other good place to start is to know that babies' eyes are smaller than adults, and the dimensions of the cornea, the AC depth, and so on and so forth are also different. I think that most of us will understand that. Now, when it comes to babies with cataracts, these eyes are usually even smaller. Uh, this table is lifted from one of the clinical trials, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail. Uh, if we look at the cataract eyes, they tend to have a smaller cornea of 10.5 millimeters compared to the fellow normal eye, which is 10.8 millimeters. So there's a clear difference between the eyes that are, uh, have cataracts and therefore have normal compared to the normal uh, pediatric eyes. Apart from anatomy, there are also other important differences uh, in pediatric cataract compared to adult cataracts. And I like to sort of arrange it in alphabetical order, the A, B, C, and D, so I remember it. Uh, biomechanically, the capsule is more elastic, uh, and by the same token, the sclera is also more elastic and soft. So the whole uh, surgical experience is a operating on a soft puddle, that's what we are, I kind of feel is like. The clinical uh, differences is that these cataracts are not the same style of cataracts that we experience otherwise. They're not liquid sclerosis. Uh, they have many different kind of variety depending on the etiologies uh, and also the appearances, again from the same book by Dr. Eisenberg, you can see that there are a lot of different shapes and sizes. And finally, is that we're dealing with a human being that is still changing its visual needs. Today, it's looking at the little blocks and building blocks on the floor. Tomorrow, they're looking at the iPhone. So you've got to make sure that what you do is going to be good for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and also, because they're during this sensitive period where any disruption to the vision uh, can cause amblyopia, again, we have to put uh, that into context when we consider what we should do for these children with cataracts. Now, about the surgical technique itself, I think the three main different things that we would know now, and also we learned from all the clinical studies people have done, is timing of surgery, the surgical technique and instrumentation, and also the options uh, for optical rehabilitation. I think first of all, talking about timing, uh, even talking before talking about infants with visually significant cataracts, I think an important concept is to realize that not all children with cataracts require surgery. Uh, and if you look at this one here, who is a child with an iridia, uh, even though there is a cataract, uh, there's no need to jump into it. And certainly that can be wait. Uh, we can wait a little longer before we think about doing cataract surgery. For infants who have visually significant cataracts, uh, we now know that actually doing it uh, sort of as an emergency on the same day uh, or a few days after birth actually is not a good idea. Uh, in the unilateral cases, I tend to do it uh, before the age of six weeks or so, uh, if possible six weeks. Uh, and in bilateral ones, I actually do it somewhere between eight to 10 weeks. And really my de decision is influenced by the study of uh, the infant AFK treatment study, or IATS, where they show that before the, um, the six week mark, let's see, oh, that, that does work. Before the six week mark and versus the after the six week mark, the risk of uh, glaucoma after cataract surgery is about uh, threefold uh, between the two age groups. And therefore, I try to uh, delay the surgery as late as possible until the six week mark to try to avoid this long term post operative complication. In talking about the instrumentation and techniques, it differs between different ages of uh, children because children come in infants, toddlers, and also older ones. I would say that the grade one and beyond kids who are compliant to Goldman tonometry or gonioscopy, really they could be quite similar to adult cataracts. You can do the cataract, put the lens in 
and then do a yak laser sometime later. For the infants, uh, they have the propensity to have a lens to regrow really rapidly, and they can have the issues of visual access for classification or a vicious form of PCO. Um, so really, they need to have, to have some special in, um, uh, attention to addressing that issue. For the toddlers, I just put a no because the ones who you, uh, among all you sell, who have seen toddlers in the clinic, you know that whatever you do to them, they just say no. They don't let you do anything. So uh, again, you've got to think about well, what is the best way to treat these uh, children, even though their PCO is less rapid than their infants. So I thought that the best way to do this would be to show you the surgical videos that I do. So this is a, uh, let me just play it first. Yeah. Cool. You just play the video. Thank you very much. It's not playing at all? No, sir. Let's try. <laughs> Let's check. Is it not going to play at all? Or? Negative, it's not showing up as a video embedded. Okay, and this one here? Um, so I can't show you any videos at all. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, what basically I do in infants, if I can do like a description in a way, is that first of all in infants I don't uh, I would do not prefer to put it in the IOL. Uh, I would put it out there right now. Uh, until the age of about six months, I would try to do a, a fake uh, treatment. Uh, I usually do two paracentesis. I use a vitrector to do a vitrectorexis uh, to navigate the dealing with the very elastic capsules. I aspirate the lens without necessarily hydrodissecting the lens, mainly because the AC will otherwise shallow. I remove the lens, and then afterwards I will do a posterior rexus as well as a generous anterior vitrectomy. Oftentimes I use triamcillin to, uh, to assist my visualization of the vitreous as well. The difference between the pediatric vit vitreous and the adult ones is that in adult, we, well, kind of get, well, we kind of get used to it when I say that. I, I will say we don't like the fact that the vitreous kind of come to your probe. Uh, in children, the opposite is true. We have, we have to go and chase the vitreous and actually remove it actively and put the probe quite deep into the eye. Um, I like to size my posterior capsulorexis just smaller than the anterior one. So therefore, at the end of the surgery or at the many months later, we can actually have the two leaflets of the capsule fused together to provide some sort of platform that hopefully several years later, when I want to go back and put an IOL in, there is the, uh, the rexus for a sulcus IOL and a capture. Um, I do use sutures all the time. I, do use, uh, I use tenovicro sutures for all the cornea incisions uh, to make sure that they don't leak. Uh, and one thing that I do say differently to some of the other surgeons is that I always use the AC maintainer. Uh, I like to keep the eye not to deflate several times during the surgery. Uh, and I think more recent studies now, for example, in the very latest meeting uh, in the uh, APOS or pediatric ophthalmology meeting in San Diego, uh, the surgical trauma or surgical disruption seems to be a pretty good risk factor for developing glaucoma afterwards. Uh, so I keep it pretty much on all the time, or the infusion all the time, so the eyes never collapse during the surgery. When we talk about toddlers, even though I don't show you the picture, uh, the um, video, I thought I'd at least show you the title so that we know what we're talking about. This was a three-year-old that I was doing. Uh, the difference here is that I would put an IOL for sure. Uh, the uh, difficulty here is to talk about how to deal with the posterior capsule or classification because they're not going to be uh, amenable to a normal YAC laser. We can do YAC lasers in UCLA while they are under general anesthesia, but prevention is better than cure. So what I would do is that I would do a standard cataract surgery that we all do. I would still use an AMC maintainer. But the difference is that after the lens is put in, I will make a sclerotomy uh, and do a pass planar uh, vitrectomy approach. Remove the uh, capsule uh, in the, behind the lens as well as the anterior vitreous. The reason I do that is because uh, rather than tilting behind the lens, which I know some other surgeons prefer to do, is that I can actually see my probe easier. And I can therefore size my posterior rexes uh, to the appropriate size, not too small, but also not too big so that the eye will force to the back. Um, in certain cases, I don't do that. Uh, I would say the two important exceptions are kids with persistent fetal vasculature or PFV. Oftentimes, we don't know what really the true plus planar is. There may be vascularized membrane. Um, okay. 
And the other exception is that children with uh, or had a history of ROP. Uh, again, we don't. I don't really know where the age of the uh, uh, retina is. Um, can you make it a little bigger? Maybe? Yeah, I'm trying to see what I can do here for you. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So this was a three-year-old that uh, uh, I was very fortunate to have this 23 gauge uh, intricate marrow forceps to uh, help with the axis. So therefore. Just try to oh the other way again. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's because of the video being uh, rich there, boy. It's a different uh, color. Um, I'll do multiple week graphs so that the rexes wouldn't go uh, out. Uh, in this particular case, because it's cerulean, uh, and the blue dots actually uh, delineated how big my capsule uh, rex is supposed to be. So that was quite nice. Um, another interesting thing about this case was that those dull blue uh, opacities. Uh, they were so hard that even the contractor couldn't chew up. Uh, it was quite interesting. So as I said, I always use an AC maintainer here, uh, and uh, unfortunately you can't really see it very clearly, but what I'm trying to do is to use this retractor to uh, literally just aspirate the lens. Uh, they really, this lens is too soft to require any manual power. Uh, when we have to, or when I have to deal with it in some incisional uh, cortex material, uh, I switch over, uh, replace the AC maintainer, and just use my left hand to get rid of it. In this case, I don't have to, To me, and then a um, lens is inserted here. I do now do the peritomy before because uh, I wasn't plan I forgot to plan about this step. I would say in this case, close the corneal incision first, uh, and then we measure up depend on age. Uh, I use a very rough and ready guide, one millimeter per age of per year of age, and then do a sclerotomy with an MPR blade, and then use a the contractor to. Uh, take out the capsule as well as the vitreous as I speak. Um, obviously the sclerotomy has to be stitched and that's the reason why I don't use a trocar uh, because uh, the sclera is soft as we talked about and uh, it's prone to leakage. Uh, I'll go back to the presentation then. Did you use a 35 or a 37? Uh, actually I use a 23, uh, the vitrector I'm talking about. Um, I find that actually the smaller ones, they become less efficient in terms of aspirating the lens. The port is smaller. Uh, even though the suction for the vitreous is better, uh, but the lens will become a little bit cumbersome. 20 may be too big. Uh, coming back to the uh, sort of new information about the optical rehabilitation, I think now we have a pretty good idea about what to do for which kind of uh, kids because of these three important uh, studies, and we'll discuss them briefly each. We've already mentioned the IATS study. This was a uh, NEI sponsored multi centered randomized controlled trial involving more than 100 kids. And what we're looking for here is having children with unilateral care right under the age of six months, and some of them get IOL, and some of them get a contact lens after a vacuum treatment, and see which one sees better. Um, we all thought, a lot of us thought that the IOL would be better off because they get early visual rehabilitation. There were also, before this trial, some reports say suggesting that the IOL could be uh, actually a preventive factor uh, of uh, pediatric glaucoma after the surgery. So by the time we actually look at the results at year one and very recently at year five, we were a little bit surprised that actually the visual, out visual outcome uh, between the two groups are no different. In fact, if you look at the visual outcome in the continent group, it actually trends better compared to the IOL group. In terms of complications, there's a huge difference between those with IOL and those uh, having the continent uh, You can see that, let me just use the toilet again, uh, both either intra-op, post-op, or uh, uh, after the surgery, uh, the IOL group has a much higher rate of complications, leading to many more re-operations compared to the group with continences. Um, if we look at the severity of these complications, uh, or first of all, talking about the specific uh, item of glaucoma, because we thought the IOL could be protective, uh, the glaucoma risk was the same in both groups. And then we're looking at the serious retinal complications, Apart from one, uh, I think two cases rather, of a detachment uh, of the retina in the continent group, other things are pretty much similar. So I think, uh, again, from the complication point of view, 
yeah, really favors the color lens group. And finally, we thought that, well, if we keep changing the color lenses all the time, surely it will be more costly. Uh, but because the IOL group requires many more reoperations at the end of five years, actually the color lens group becomes cheaper. So really, I think the study is pretty convincingly saying that in infants, uh, doing a contour lens, uh, infants under the age of six months, uh, doing a contour lens as well than IOL is a better idea for these children. Now there was a slightly confusing study from uh, where I was in UK, looking at uh, IOL under ch uh, in children under the age of two, including infants and toddlers. Uh, again, it's a multi-center uh, study, but it was a prospective cohort study rather than a randomized controlled trial. And at one year, when they report the results, it was slightly confusing mainly because they wanted to show what's age-appropriate uh, visual acuity, and really that the, the table doesn't really make it really easy to understand. But what they're trying to portray is that uh, patients with either bilateral cataracts or unilateral, unilateral cataracts, those with IOLs seem to have, uh, the, the among the children with IOLs inserted at a time, there's a, uh, a bigger proportion of children achieving age-appropriate vision compared to the color lens group in bilateral and also unilateral cases. That's at one year. They also looked at the uh, predictive factors for visual outcome at one year, and they found that, again, uh, IOL in, in, uh, insertion was a really, really important factor. The only other factor that was important was patch, which we kind of expected. The, the results of this study kind of makes, me, makes us think, well, is it really true that maybe the RATS was an anomaly? The only thing is that this year, literally, the uh, IOL under two released a five-year result, and all the results they reported previously was turned on its own head. Uh, in the follow-up study, they included more people, uh, but they also make sure that the uh, analysis is concentrated on children who can actually report vision, uh, i.e. Uh, they don't have any developmental delay. And when they look at these uh, over 150 uh, children, they find that, again, the visual outcome in the both groups are the same, the glaucoma risk of the uh, both groups are also the same. So I think uh, uh, even though the trial at the time, or the study at the time, suggested maybe our well was beneficial, at the end of the day, over the more longer period of follow-up, uh, the contralenses seem to be also uh, uh, becoming as, at least as equal, if not as superior. And then this is just coming up three months ago, looking at when is it safe, really, to put it in IOL. Uh, and it's actually by the same uh, study investigators who carry, uh, who's conducted a study of the IATS. They looked at children who are seven months or older, and actually they found that in these children, a lot of them get very reasonable vision, and also uh, they have a much better uh, risk uh, factor pro uh, risk profile compared to the IATS. And you can see that both the intraocular uh, complications and adverse events are significantly different between the IATS study group and the TAPS or toddler study group, uh, with the toddler study group being much lower risk, uh, having complications afterwards. And uh, if you want to delve into the details, then again, again, the adverse events are also much less common uh, among the children under the TAP study. So I think by the time about six or seven months old, if there's a need to put in the IOL, I would definitely consider it. If there's a way that I can think the child is still compliant to condolences, because of the benefit of uh, changing the color lenses and therefore changing the focus for the child until later on, I would still probably err on the side of doing the color lenses. Uh, for children who are one year or above, uh, I think my default is I will. So in summary, for the pediatric cataract surgery, uh, there are important differences now which we understand. Uh, there are important surgical adaptations, which I would like to show you next time maybe. Uh, and for infantile uh, cataracts, I think the evidence supports the use of color lenses. Now, just changing gear to the sort of the corners side of the things, um, we, I think last time, I think Manuel actually asked me about, uh, I wish we talked about pediatric character, group, uh, character codes. So I remember putting this topic in here in this uh, talk today. Um, what is the current concept of pediatric character codes? Well, the first of all, let's just talk about, I think, again, what we know already uh, over the last 20, 30 years. I think the clinical features of pediatric character codes is known now is pretty similar to what we expect in adults. Uh, the topographic features is also similar, although I think more kids tend to have this dimple prone shape rather than the inferior steepling. Um, there's also this general consensus that uh, pediatric keratoconus seem to progress faster, and also when they present to the office, they tend to be already 
uh, more severe. And, and really boils down to is this one paper in 2012 by Chazis and Hafezi, who looked at uh, about 50 eyes or so and saying that 88% of these children will progress within a year or two. Uh, they also uh, looked at the uh, severity of these children and they found that 30% of these children had the, the highest age of keratoconus uh, compared to what we usually expect in the adult cohort. And because of that, we have been thinking about that we need to uh, help these children as soon as possible. Uh, until recently, we couldn't do very much, but now we can because we have uh, uh, corneal cross-linking. Um, this is a photochemical reaction involving basically three steps. Removing the epithelium, putting the myoglobin, and then shine a UV light. And that tends to stiffen the cornea and helps to uh, delay the progression. Why is this important in pediatric keratoconus? Well, if this is the keratoconus, uh, sort of the lateral, Curve. I like to think of this as the keratoconic Reynolds curve. Uh, if you think about thyroid, this is how it looks like in keratoconus. It gets worse at the young 20s or so, and then it stabilizes after 30 or 40 years old. But if we can get to these children earlier on and treat them, because we can then actually stop the disease progression, we can actually reduce the overall disease burden for these children. Maybe they can keep themselves in using glasses alone and not necessarily have to use the really advanced scleral lenses. So there's a really good reason why we want to do uh, current cross-linking for these children as early as possible. There are, however, some important questions we have to consider before we buy the machine and just go and do it. First of all is when do we have, uh, when should we actually do the procedure? And second thing is how do we do this procedure in children? The when is slightly more complicated now. Uh, I would say last year was a bit of a, a period of exploration. We were all trying to find out how we can get these children done or how we can get any patient uh, to have cross-linking. This year, we've seen a lot more position statements about how uh, certain patients should qualify for uh, keratoconus, and this is just one of the many criteria that um, some insurance companies have released to us. Basically, uh, it is 14 years or, uh, or older, and also there must be uh, evidence of progression. The issue about pediatric keratoconus and this position statement is that Half the time, I may not be able to get a really accurate measurement because they're not very cooperative with the pentacams. Uh, if they're 14 years or younger, maybe I wouldn't be able to qualify in either phase at all. Um, the other thing is that for refraction, maybe I can base on that, but really, pediatric refraction is not really that accurate. Uh, the subjective side is not really helpful at all. Uh, and though, so I always find myself that I'm ticking the boxes and there are always some boxes that I cannot tick because this position statement here is just not designed for children. So I think we're still sort of working out when can we do it, can we do it on a compassionate basis, etc. <coughs> the next thing is actually how to do it. Even if we're talking about 14 years old uh, children, there are some set of patients who are developmentally delayed. They cannot actually tolerate the awake procedure, which we usually do for adults and also some of the adolescents. So should we do these uh, procedure under sedation or under general anesthesia? And if we are doing these uh, procedure under sedation and general anesthesia, how is the actual setup? Uh, if the video doesn't work, I don't think, oh, it does work this time. Uh, so this is uh, how I do it in, uh, when I was training out of this country, hence it's off label, I would say, um, doing the cross-linking under general anesthesia. Because this, uh, even though he looks big, he's actually a 12-year-old with severe Down syndrome, uh, and he was combative in the clinic, and therefore we were unable to actually uh, examine him in the lane. So we have to actually examine him uh, under anesthesia. And then we actually uh, set up the machine while he's asleep. Uh, it likes to know that actually the um, chemical, the photochemical reaction has no uh, reaction, I suppose, with the anesthetic agents. It's completely safe. Uh, we did uh, use an endotracheal tube to make sure the anesthetic agent and oxygen is not in the air. Um, positioning of the eye was interesting because obviously the child's not to look at the light. So we either have to have uh, a four, pair of forceps and just literally holding on the light for the whole duration of the uh, uh, ultraviolet uh, period of time. Uh, and then later on we find that we can actually use a wax cell and just put it in the fornix and seem, some, seems to be able to stim, uh, stabilize the eye. Uh, for, this for these children, uh, I tend to do them bilaterally so we don't have to go through the general and see them twice. Mm -hmm. uh, but really in California, I'm not sure who is doing that right now. Uh, I think in Kansas City and also in somewhere in the East Coast, they are 
side to do these. And uh, fortunately, I think in UCLA, we're now exploring to having this capability under general anesthesia. For post-optic re regimen, because it is painful, uh, and also it may be impossible to remove the bandage contact lenses in these children once they're awake, uh, sometimes we actually leave them with antibiotic and sterile ointment uh, and give them morphine as well as the Tylenol and Montreal to keep them uh, 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 comfortable afterwards. Um, this slide is a little bit jammed up, but what I was trying to say is that I think it's important uh, message now is to just remember that cross-linking doesn't mean visual rehabilitation. Uh, I think there's a lot of talk currently about uh, you can cross-link anybody because you can put a you can put a scleral lenses onto the patient and they can see well. Uh, but some children just cannot wear these lenses. Uh, the one that I've shown here is another patient with uh, advanced keratoconus with Down syndrome. Uh, even I can cross-link and hold the progression, uh, it really needs something else to help him to see. And really at the back, what we did was do a, a DALK, and that actually solved two, uh, solved two problems in one go. So I think for cross-linking for in children, it, uh, first of all, the condition could be a little bit challenging to diagnose and monitor. Uh, the new treatment does raise some new issues for in these children. Uh, I think general anesthesia is probably the way to go for at least a subset of children who otherwise cannot tolerate the procedure. Uh, but I would still consider lamellar uh, keratoplasty in those who need it for visual purposes. And finally, just to uh, for the last five, five to ten minutes or so, I want to talk about something that is a little bit rarer, which is pediatric refractive surgery. Uh, it sounds crazy that we want to use laser in a child, but uh, I think there are some situations, again, that could be useful. I'm not gonna play this. So uh, the reason why we want to do this is because, again, children with uh, neurobehavioral disorders oftentimes have refractive error and sometimes very, very high degree of refractive error. And they don't like to have things on their faces. So having glasses is a non-go. And contact lenses really is going to be a fight, especially if they're older. Uh, and Larry Tyson in St. Louis coined this term visual autism, where because they cannot see their environment, they are locked into their own sort of internal environment and becomes autistic. Um, the poor vision actually leads to the poor behavior, and the poor behavior leads to the poor vision, and they are forever locked in this vicious cycle. So we want to do something to break this cycle. So what are the options that we can do? The mainly three things are the laser refractive surgery, uh, refractive lens exchange, or more recently I would say faking Iowa. Uh, first of all, the laser refractive surgery actually has been done for maybe over 10 to 15, 20 years now. Uh, this study actually by um, Aiello et al. from Spain is a meta-analysis looking at uh, 15 studies uh, in children with both myopia and hyperopia. The important thing here to realize is that the numbers we're treating is very, very high. Uh, I think the low degree of refractive error is acceptable and they have functional vision and that's why they're not really included in these studies. These are the children that otherwise will be completely functionally blind. Um, the meta-analysis find that the all three techniques of LASIK, LASIK, and PRK, uh, they are safe and effective. You can see that the uncorrected vision improved from 1.4 dogma to about 0.6, which again, for many of these children, becomes very functional. Um, complications rare, I would say, or, or less, not very common, but if we're gonna do LASIK, then there is a 7% chance of flat-related and because of that, I think many surgeons do tend to do a PRK procedure instead. Um, just like cross-linking, there are issues with uh, the PRK. This is a five-year-old with uh, Angelman syndrome and high hyperopia and cannot wear any glasses. Um, similar to the cross-linking we have to do under general anesthesia, and similar to cross-linking, they will not fixate until later. So we have to, uh, again, manually hold on to the eye making sure that they are actually aligned to the laser. Uh, and uh, during the examination under anesthesia, before the day of surgery, uh, we actually would for verify the uh, cyclopedic refraction and treat that. Um, I did use uh, MMC, a vitamin C here, to try to reduce the haze, so hopefully it's not as high as 7%. Uh, and uh, these students do get uh, bandage condolences and the same uh, pain relief. Uh, and we see the next day we move the lens if possible. Um, but there's still other issues because we cannot really assess our outcome. Uh, these children are not likely to report uh, that they can see better. Although from the parents, we do understand that they have much better behavior. They start to interact with their, uh, not just toys, but also people. They start to recognize faces and actually have a social smile. And for many families, that is really important uh, to have. 
uh, the, the uh, left issue here called the elephant in the room. Uh, the elephant in the room is that you have to have the laser in the OR room, and that's not always feasible in, uh, in many of the ORs. Uh, there is a uh, on uh, upcoming multi-center study. The font size is small, but this is by the, uh, the pediatric uh, research group, the PEDIC, looking at uh, examining laser surgery uh, in uh, ileosometropic amyotropia, and that is an upcoming trial. And I think we will get to know more about uh, the effectiveness and safety profile of these techniques. Refractive lens exchange has also been done for a long time, again, for uh, very high uh, uh, refractive errors. Uh, going back to uh, the author, Laurie Tyson, who did it in 2006, uh, he did a variety of surgery, including just lensectomy, lensectomy with our insertion, uh, and also a uh, lens, uh, lens aspiration, and then primary, caps, uh, primary posterior capsular axis with anterior trajectory. Um, he finds that a lot of them have a very good uh, refractive outcome, uh, but there's a fairly big number of uh, cases with complications of facial access or versification. So again, the uh, vitrectomy seems to be important in these children, even though they could be older. That was the study for high myopia, and there are now a few studies coming out looking at high uh, hypermetropia. Uh, and this is again a child with Angelman syndrome, and uh, again, the better behavior was reported after these uh, uh, surgeries. Uh, compared to laser, obviously it's intraocular surgery, so there are important risks to think about. Uh, and also uh, putting a lens in, uh, not that the lens causes problems, it's just that we cannot predict the growth of these children. So therefore, today could be minus one, but tomorrow could be minus three. So uh, we still got some uh, unanswered questions to work out. Uh, some of the more exciting developments, I would say, in the lens refractive surgery is the faking IOL. Uh, and really, there are two different options the iris fixated IOL, uh, as well as the uh, uh, intraocular columnar lens or ICL. Uh, most of these studies are done in Europe and they are off label currently. Uh, this study here was done in France, <coughs> looking at uh, high myopia. Um, they, can, they found that using a artisan and iris fixated lenses, corrected all the myopia, they just needed the aesthetic correction, and the vision become 2025 by six months. Uh, this separate group looked at uh, a few more children, seven children, and you can see all of them have very, very high myopia uh, beforehand, and afterwards, all of them become sort of normal range, obviously. The important uh, uh, issue that the Perusian and the study found out is that all these seven eyes had a steady decline of endothelial cell over the, uh, the course of the study. And this is a seven children study. In a much bigger study uh, done a few years ago now in the Netherlands, we looked at over 500 eyes, uh, including both children and adults. And what they find is that with the artisan uh, iris fixator lenses, uh, there is a uh, definite decrease in absolute numbers. And also, if you use the cutoff of 25% uh, of a lifetime, then uh, in about 16 years, everybody had over 25% uh, of endothelial cell loss. So I'm not sure whether this is the best approach. I think more will need to come out in terms of effectiveness. But at the same time, if I can buy a child to see well for 16 years before considering some other surgery, it may be a small price to pay. Uh, we now have very, I mean, uh, Dr. Lee just showed us very elegant surgery of DMAC. I think in a few years later on, we probably even have endothelial cell therapy. Uh, so it may not be such a bad thing to have these people see earlier. So therefore the amblyopia does not become a permanent problem in the first place. Uh, the other one, as I said, is the uh, ICL. Uh, again, the first study was done in France, looking at five children with high myopia, and again, they are ranging into the teens and then became single figures afterwards. Uh, and in US, actually, uh, 2017, there was a study, uh, again, by Larry Tyson, looking at 40 eyes of uh, 23 children with the ICL. Um, the vision overall improved dramatically to about 2050 or so, uh, and the refractive error pretty much completely uh, negligible after surgery. There are some complications. Uh, the, there are two eyes that had pupillary block after the ICL insertion and needed uh, laser iridectomy. Uh, but interestingly, they did, not, they did not see any endothelial cell decline compared to the other spectator IOL. Well. So this may be something that uh, would be something that we can look into in a bit more detail. Uh, and I'm actually exploring the image of UCLA right now for uh, at least the adult who can otherwise not uh, able to wear the glasses. So in summary for the, uh, the whole talk, I would say our understanding 
and instrumentation for pediatric care surgery is better now. Uh, there are some really important studies for infants who guide uh, myself as also uh, a lot of other people about the use of condolences and uh, IOLs. The pediatric care articulus, uh, I think it's important to recognize early because then you can treat them earlier and hold the progression. Uh, and the pediatric refractive surgery is something that is exciting and I think uh, something more is going to come out in the next few years. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for kind of the first section? Yes. With regards to the pediatric patients, for the very young patients that you decided to need cataract surgery and um, you will implant an IOL, when you do the IOL calculation, what do you target as a first step with the refractive error, taking into account that the actual length of the physical time is at least significant amount of shift? Thank you, that's a very good question. So uh, again, the uh, IATS have given us some really important uh, information on that regard. They found that uh, somewhere between, uh, I would give you the formula that I use, I think that would be easier. Uh, the formula that I use is that H plus X equals six and a half, okay? Uh, X being the uh, refractive error that I would like to aim for. Uh, now, going back to the IATS, they actually found that if we aim for plus eight, or even plus 10, it may be actually better off to have to reach the median uh, refractive change at the end of the study. But what they also found is that there's a big spread uh, of uh, refractive error after about five years. So really I think is a bit of a fudge. Uh, I find that six and a half worked well for me uh, and that's why I use, uh, tend to use. I do find that in older children, the protection is more accurate uh, in younger children, they're not, and that's the other reason why I want delay surgery. IOL formulas, I think other studies have looked into it. Uh, SRKT, HOFQ, they're all roughly the same. There's no superiority, one or the other. Any other questions? Okay, well, can, can I ask yeah. you a question? <laughs> Theoretically, if you could do cross-linking in a child here, and it wasn't a logistics issue or insurance issue, what's the youngest you would consider? Um, I think the youngest that I would consider is the one that I know the character is confirmed. Uh, I think there are, the, the, our current methods of assessment is not necessarily adequate for children. Uh, and uh, I don't want to spill too much beans because we're going to talk about that in our annual seminar in two weeks time. But uh, I think one of the debates that we're going to have is how do we actually know kids have keratoconus? And, and actually it's not as clear cut as you think, uh, mainly because most of our devices have the normative data based on adults. Uh, so I, I still like to use progression to look at and look for keratoconus rather than relying on various indices. Uh, but uh, as soon as I find it, uh, and I think progression is there, then I would treat. I think the youngest that I've treated was eight. I, I do use Pentacam if they can cooperate. Uh, otherwise, I actually use key readings as well as refraction. And CCT, of course. So you do use Pentacam? Yes, but I, I don't have any financial interest in no, Pentacam. No, 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 no. <laughs> I find it easier to do. Uh, it's a bit, um, uh, my institution have both Galilei and Pentacam. Uh, I haven't got a lot of the data, well, let's go down back a, a step. A lot of the studies on cross-linking as well as progression of keratoconus are based on the Pentacap system uh, because of the work, excellent work by Ambrosio Jr. and uh, uh, Bailey. And therefore I rely on a lot of those on those platforms. Uh, Galilei probably is a better platform for children, however, because it's faster. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I know that between platforms, you can't really use those numbers uh, uh, and compare. You really have to stick to one platform. And if I have to choose one or the other, right now, in my position, uh, I would like to use the Pentacam just because I see I have more evidence uh, to follow. And then it's also important to note that FDA approval is starting at what age? 14. 
Yeah. So yeah, holding it up. And there's ongoing <laughs> studies right now to try to lower that, I yeah. believe. And and so that's kind of the goal, because the thought is it's going to progress during puberty primarily. And 14 most kids have completed puberty by that point in time. So it's it is just trying to intervene as early as possible. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well then we're actually on time, so we're going to take our break. Uh, please use the opportunity to go and see uh, 